Hey, everybody. Um, what a couple of days. How's everybody doing? How's everybody handling this uh, this roller coaster? Um, I have to tell you that this has been... Um, the, the, the past few years have obviously been uh, the weirdest political times of my life, save for uh, post 9-11 and the, the madness leading up to um, the Iraq war. This is a whole different level of batshit crazy, man. I mean, I, you know, I was getting ready for this thing. By, by the way, cheers to us for making it through this week. The debate was this week. <laughs> the debate was this week. The debate feels, my God, right? Like a month ago, right? It feels like at least a month ago. The The taxes were this week. That's exactly right, Robert. The The revelations about the taxes. It was, it was a week ago. Holy shit. Um, here we are. Uh, I, uh, what is time? I, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> go figure. Uh, and here we are on a Sunday to go over those thoughts. Um, I think that we are in, I, I mean, unprecedented doesn't even cover it anymore. Unprecedented feels like a, um, it feels like a cop out at this point, right? It just feels like this sort of thing that we say that really doesn't hold any power or any weight. Um, it's it, parts of this are unimaginable. I mean, not not Donald Trump catching uh, COVID nineteen because I mean, that dude was a dumbass who just took every opportunity to expose himself to it and surrounded himself. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but watching this footage of the Republicans just hugging each other and basically daring one another to give them COVID, um, it's very weird. It's very weird. It's like watching a. Um, like a, a pandemic movie and like the, the, those sort of like close shots where like you realize that one person is infecting another and they're infecting the other and they're infecting another. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not, not unimaginable that he would get COVID-19, but on top of it, and, and we're going to get into it. Absolutely. Tonight. Um, this relentless propaganda that has popped up around this and not only propaganda about, when he tested positive, where he tested positive, whether or not, you know, he, he went and, uh, and did a fundraiser and infected a bunch of other people. Uh, you know, that, that, that's one thing. But on top of it, it's like these doctors. And, and listen, like, I've got thoughts about this and I've got some historical context for all of this. But watching it in real time, I mean, bad shit, crazy, man. And, and now, so I was getting ready for this thing. And uh, this little uh, drive around stunt that, that Trump just did after days, exactly, Amber, after days of these like videos, uh, I have to tell you, it's the most reality TV thing I've ever seen. Him being like, I'm telling you a secret here on Twitter. I'm about to go say hello to some people. Like, oh my God, that's like brand marketing stuff. Like, I don't know who it is. In, in the Trump administration who is running the propaganda at this point, but it is embarrassing. It is embarrassing the way that they're doing this thing. The the signing of papers that have absolutely nothing on them. Uh, he looks like complete shit. Um, and, and just this like parading around, he's totally fine. These doctors, which I can't wait to talk about because th that has been a, uh, it's been like a special like tripwire. You know, we talk all the time about like these, these moments where like you cross a line in the authoritarian playbook. We we hop, skipped and jumped over a couple of lines. I, I mean, it's pretty incredible. Victor, that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. And, and we're going to get into that. Um, so I'm just going to start this because I got obviously a lot of questions um, along the same lines uh, for a couple of things. First things first, Drip Brew says, is it possible that Trump is feigning illness in order to regain sympathy from his followers? Addy says, is Trump faking COVID? I've had a lot of people ask me. Um, no, Trump has COVID. 
100 percent. Trump has COVID. The question here isn't whether or not he has COVID. The question is, how sick is he? Uh, I have people that are in the Republican Party. I have people in the administration who, like, have told me they're like, yeah, the old man is sick. The boss is sick. And the question is, how much have they hidden how sick he actually is? Like, I understand. And this is one of the problems that I wanted to talk about tonight. Like, instantaneously, everybody said almost immediately they were like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he's actually sick. I don't know if I can trust anything. That is the damage that Donald Trump has done with shared reality. He has done damage to shared reality to the point where this situation, which, by the way, is completely harmful to him. Uh, it hurts. His, it, it, it does make him look weak because of our understanding of, oh, I know, Victor, I know that they like manipulating a false reality. He's actually sick. They're manipulating it on the other side of it. That's the thing here is he actually is sick. Um, I've heard these had multiple instances of oxygen. I've heard that he was absolutely terrified of dying. Uh, apparently, one of the things that Trump is really terrified of besides germs, and I think this plays into the two, he, he has a complete and utter fear of mortality. I mean, and who wouldn't? But I think this is somebody who like this thing, like really, really sort of like spurred that. Um. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just absolutely insane how he comes down with this thing and it doesn't help him. Uh, it, it, it actually it just confirms that, you know, this thing that he's been downplaying that he knew was real. It just confirms that it's real and that the administration isn't in, they're incapable of handling a gathering, much less running the government of the United States of America. Isn't that incredible? They can't even hold a gathering without getting literally everyone sick. And, and on top of that, like, like look at look at what, what's had to have happened here. You have, like, the head of Notre Dame. You have Chris Christie. You have Co uh, uh, Kellyanne at this point. You probably have Bill Barr. I mean, at this point, it sounds like it's Bill Barr. But he has hurt reality to the point. Carolyn, we're going to talk about Pence. We're going to talk a lot, a lot about Pence here in a minute is what we're going to talk about. Anyway, he has hurt reality to the point where we can't even trust the possibility that he has gotten a disease that could kill him and will most definitely hurt him politically. Everything has to be like multidimensional chest. Everything, everything has to be this big hidden maneuver. And it's not true. Trump lies about everything. He has his own fabricated reality. But in this case, like they tried to hide the fact that he was sick. They would have got away. They would have went with it if he didn't start having symptoms and they had to take him to the hospital and everyone else started testing positive as well. The thing that they're hiding in this case is how sick he is. He's very sick. He is very, very sick. The stuff that he's taking, the treatments that he's on, the way that they have treated him. I mean, all of this posture. If you want to know what Donald Trump is afraid of, if you want to know what Donald Trump is insecure about, look at the overcompensation. It's, it's these videos, it's these pictures, it's this stunt in the car. He doesn't want to look weak. He doesn't want people to know how sick he actually is. I don't think they'll cover it up if he dies. I, I, I think that, that that would just be what it is. And we're going to talk about why that is. Because there's, there's something that has been missed in all of these conversations that we have to talk about. And it's a really big part of this story. So we'll talk about that here in a second. But no, I, I, he's sick. He is legitimately sick. I haven't talked to a single person who is either on the right or around the White House who believes for a second that any of this is a political maneuver. Everyone says he's actually sicker than everyone thinks that he is. That's it. And these big jumps in the oxygen level, it's not great. It's not great. And the 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 leaked report that, you know, there's no clear path forward in his recovery. I mean, this is a touch and go situation. It really, truly, honestly is. Uh, luck be a lady, luck be a lady says, how ill do you suppose Trump is? Can we trust any info coming from the White House? One, we can't trust any info coming from the White House. This is absolutely just a complete propaganda machine, top to bottom. And, and everything that they do, I mean, and here's the thing about it, really, they are so piss poor at this. Like, thank God that this authoritarian isn't competent 
and that his incompetency is completely transparent and that the people around him are the bottom dregs of the barrel. I mean, thank God nobody actually wants to work for Donald Trump besides a bunch of people who like are desperate for jobs and would take anything to get offered to them. Thank God, because they are so transparent in anything. And if they weren't so transparent and if they weren't so incompetent, my God, the media would assist them left and right. I don't know about you. I've been so frustrated over the past couple of days because there are certain people on this watch in the media who are like handling this thing seriously and like actual reporters. And then there's that switch that goes and it happens whenever there's like an attack or there's a tragedy or i don't know the president of the united states comes to, comes down with covid and instantaneously it's like oh country over journalism which is insane uh but yeah if they were the least bit competent like this thing would this thing would get real out of hand real quickly if they were competent this whole thing's laughable it is it is th that's the terrible thing about it is it's so ridiculous and it's so transparent that it, it 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 borders on satire like it really truly does it borders on satire and i saw somebody asked about death of stalin so we're going to talk about that in a minute but um it really is it it, it reads like like satire it's so ridiculous and transparent i think he's very sick I think he is very sick. That is everything that I've heard about this situation is that Donald Trump is uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump is sicker uh, than what's being told to us. And I wouldn't trust this White House at all. Not even a little bit. No, they, they have lied about this thing from the very beginning. They would have put a lid on it if they possibly could. But it got out from underneath them when everybody else started getting sick. Uh, Julia says, a refresher on the fascist playbook as it refers to gaslighting truth. What is truth? Also, he wants us thinking and talking about him all the time. First of all, you couldn't be more right about the narcissism. This going out and waving at the crowds and all of that, he misses being the center of attention. I mean, we're getting more videos of Donald Trump while he's in the hospital than we got of him when he was healthy and in the White House. This, it's so pathetic. He's such a pathetic, pitiable person. My God, is he so sad. And like having to go out and wave at these people, it's just it's just so bad. And then on top of it, he he put at risk everyone around him. Like he released I mean, he, he he put at risk like Secret Service people. He put at risk drivers, chauffeurs, he put at risk hospital staff. God knows who else. God knows who else he put at risk. And all because he wanted to go out and get his fix. It's so awful. And as far as the fascist playbook when it comes to gaslighting, they want it. They want you to question reality. This is called flooding the zone with shit. If you haven't become familiar with it, you absolutely have to. And this is like one of the like crash course stuff. Like you have to understand this to understand the moment. Um, and, and by the way, like this is always attributed to Steve Bannon. But what this actually is, is this is Soviet misinformation and propaganda. And the entire idea that they came up with is when you flood the zone with shit and you just constantly throw out fake information, if you do it so much and it clogs up all the channels, it gets to the point where everybody questions reality in the first place. And if everybody questions reality, then you don't even have to actually construct an error-proof reality. You just have to make sure that nobody believes what is actually the truth. And it creates an apathetic, powerless society. It's exactly what happened when it was announced that Donald Trump had tested positive for COVID-19. Everybody immediately was like, this has to be a lie because we can't trust anything that he says. So even when he says something that's true that he doesn't actually want to admit is true, it happens. And so... Yes, I have. Virginia just said, have you read the conspiracy theories? Uh, I totally imagine that's what was going to happen. I thought that I thought there'd be more of the talk that he was poisoned at the debate. Uh, I've, I've seen it in some far right circles. Um, and this is one of those things where, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've noticed something weird. I was going to um, I was going to talk about this on Twitter, but I was going to save it for tonight, actually which is um, the far right is doing a weird thing and the Trumpists are doing a weird thing. They're continually posting as if Don everything's fine and Donald Trump isn't sick. They're not even mentioning his sickness. I thought what would happen was it was just going to be round the clock sympathy, sign this card for President Donald Trump. Your president is sick. Pray for Donald Trump. They're not talking about it. I don't know 
exactly what's going on, but it, it like they are pretending like nothing's happening. It's a really weird thing, and that goes into a little bit of what I'm going to talk about in a second, which is what I think is happening right now on the right, and what could potentially happen. And again, it's the story that absolutely nobody is talking about. But the entire point of fascists and authoritarians, particularly in the new media age, is you don't have to convince everyone that what you're saying is true. As long as you tell everybody that everything is untrue, well, then everything is equal. And it's absolutely crazy making. This is tiring. This is a really exhausting thing. I've got multiple questions here that we're going to get to later about how to take care of ourselves and, and how to maintain our mental health in the face of this. We're being abused. We are being put through trauma. And one of the things that you find, particularly when it comes to like socialization, I wrote about this um, in my book about masculinity, like men are put through so much trauma and so much abuse that eventually they just become traumatized and some of them abusive. They become like, like they, they, they become immersed in it to the point where they, they, they start behaving that way. Right now, we are being abused as a culture and we're being conditioned to lose our hope and become apathetic. That's what authoritarians want. They want us to constantly question reality to the point where there is no such thing as reality. They want us to feel like there's no way that we have any power whatsoever. And I mean, yeah, we have rights, but why would we use them? It's not even worth going out to vote. It's not even worth trying to make a difference. I mean, you know, it's all a bunch of lies. It's all crooked. Why should we do anything? That's what they want. That is the ideal society for an authoritarian. So all of this stuff is completely by design. And, you know, this is this is one of the things that neo-fascists are relying on in this current environment. Like in the past, it was all about getting people involved in the myth. Now it's about getting as many people involved in the myth as you possibly can and just demoralizing everybody else and making them live in fear and making them question reality as it is. I would guess, and here's a quick thing, I, I, I would guess that there will be some sort of a major disinformation thing that pops up in the next few days. I imagine people are probably waiting, the people who would run disinformation or probably run uh, propaganda or, you know, deep fake videos or, you know, fake compromat or whatever you want to say. Um, I would guess that they're probably waiting to get a better idea of where Donald Trump is health wise. But there's probably something that's going to drop in the next few days about Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or the Democratic Party or the DNC or something along those lines that will probably be a piece of misinformation. Like it's not over. Like we're, we're going to talk more about the election and the consequences of it. But the election's not over. Just because Donald Trump is in the hospital doesn't mean that everything ceases to happen and suddenly the threat is over. Remember what I've said before in past live streams. We're always looking for heroes and villains and silver bullets to solve our problems. Donald Trump isn't the disease. He's a symptom. This thing that's happening with him is a giant passion play. It's a, it's, I mean, it's, it's the best TV the TV's had since Donald Trump became a candidate for president. It's true. Like, they love it. They love showing him flying off and, you know, going to Walter Reed and taking this ride and all this. He knows that they love it. But there's more stuff going on. That, like, it's not over. Like, just because he has this disease and he's suffering from it doesn't mean that all other operations cease to exist. And we'll talk more about that in a second. And again, the story that nobody is actually talking about and needs to. Lewis All says, watch the death of Stalin and highly recommend it. What do I think of it? I think the death of Stalin is required viewing right now. Because what we're actually watching is late era Soviet style propaganda falling apart bullshit. So one of the things that ends up happening and uh, another required thing to watch. There's a really good documentary uh, by a guy named Adam Curtis. I would watch everything Adam Curtis has ever done. He, he is uh, absolutely brilliant. His documentaries are wonderful. You can find them for free, most of them on YouTube. Uh, and, and, and he talks a lot about these myths and these ideas. And in Soviet Russia, like there came a point, and, and by the way, I've been doing research right now. I'm, I'm writing a new book. Cheers. Um, and I'm relearning history. And the thing that I'm finding is we have these big, giant myths. And when they run out of power and they run out of gas, all of a sudden, a new myth comes in to take its place. Which, by the way, is an important thing to keep in mind from what we're going to talk about in a little bit. But Death of Stalin is all about 
how the Soviet Union started to run out of power. And, and the control and the authoritarianism that was in place was so huge and overwhelming, but also inadequate. It's no way to run a society that like all of a sudden you reach a point where science, facts, reality don't matter. And it just starts eating itself. And Death of Stalin is very funny first and foremost but it's also very sad because you watch it and you you start to realize you're like holy shit the united states of america and russia were just mirror images of each other and i believe i wrote about this in american rule i believe that it's not like we won the cold war i think that the soviet union went down first and dealt us a mortal blow and we've been bleeding out from it for forever we gave up on our principles we engaged in authoritarianism and white supremacist control, and we didn't really uh, leave much room for democracy or human decency. Watch Death of Stalin, because there is a very, very real possibility that we are in late stage Americanism. We've reached a point where it's like an Ouroboros. We've just started swallowing our own myths and regurgitating them, and everything just doesn't make any sense. We're becoming a failed nation. We can't we can't help our own people. We can't save people after, you know, during a pandemic, after major disasters, the infrastructure is crumbling, healthcare is non-existent, our educational system is in trouble. Now all you have is the myth. Now all of a sudden, all you have is the cult of personality and the cult of the mythology. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's just a big vacuum waiting to be filled. And what fills the vacuum almost every time is fascism and authoritarianism. Which, by the way, that's what I'm writing about. I'm going back, I'm relearning uh, the history of Western civilization and uh, tracing the rise of authoritarianism and fascism. And surprise, surprise, it's all about mythology and control and, and power. And what you find, and, and by the way, I, I tweeted about this earlier today. In my research today, I was sitting here with my coffee, and it was like I came across this line, and it's like, Rome suffered because of a generational pandemic and climate change. So I was like, well, hell cool feeling real good about that but anyway death of stalin is really really good because it shows what happens when a society has reached its terminal point of, of momentum and america has reached a terminal point i keep telling everyone we're on the precipice of something we either figure it out and make it good and make it better and make it more real and human or you know we plunge in with gnashing teeth into fascism and authoritarianism those are the options. I hate to tell you, but there are people out there who have opinions about where this should go. We're going to talk more about them in a second. The visions for a future right now are regressive. They're oppressive. I mean, they're all about turning back the clock. They're about going back to a point where myth overrides democracy and liberal democracy and pluralism and, and human dignity. All these people, it's either religious fundamentalism or it's fascism through nationalism, all that stuff. It's just the, the, the ideas for the future, the way to change. Those are all about dra dragging us back into the past where people didn't have rights and people were even more oppressed than they are now. We have to start coming up with a better vision. And that better vision had better be radically different. We would better have something a lot better that's going to inspire people and fill that vacuum when this mythology falls apart because I'm telling you right now, we're on the verge of this thing falling apart. And Sarah, by the way, cheers to Sarah, old student of mine. If it plunges, would you leave the U.S. and where would you go? If this thing falls apart, if the United States, the American empire falls apart, I have to tell you, like, we're going to drag a lot of people down. Because there is a very, very strong interconnected neo-fascistic movement all around the world. And they're waiting on that. Because these people understand that if America goes down, they're going to have an opportunity to build something out from its ashes. And again, right now I'm studying like the history of Western civilization. I'm looking at the fall of Rome. What happens is Rome falls. Other empires take their little scraps and they build up from it, right? And they figure out their own ways to have power and their own ways to have dominion. There are people in the United States right now who are extremists and terrorists who are trying to figure out a way to make America, like, you know, they're trying to figure out a way to hasten the fall of America because they think they can make something uh, out of the ashes of it. And there are people around the world in Europe, uh, in Western civilization, so-called, they're waiting on it to fall apart and they're ready to go. So we better come up with something better. We would better come up with something more real and human and better. All right, here we go.
big topic of the time that nobody is talking about. Josh. Pence knows beyond a shadow of doubt that all of this is God will, and that terrifies me more than anything. You. Also, just to throw this in, Amber said, what are my predictions for Tuesday's VP debate? Okay, here you go. Number one, Mike Pence could never become president of the United States on his own volition. Not on his own merits, not on his own talent. It never could have happened. He never would have ran. He never would have made it past the primaries. He never would have been a major party's uh, uh, nominee for president. He's in a perfect position because Donald Trump needed the white evangelical dominionist vote. And so, you know, he needed that to sort of whitewash all of his sins and, and predilections and all that bullshit. So Pence gets in there. And I have to tell you, Pence has been incredible at one thing. And that is standing in the back of the room and avoiding all of the shit. Like this stuff that's been going on in the administration, you'll always notice outside of the Flynn thing, the Flynn thing almost took him down very, very quickly. But Pence has been really good at bringing in what he needs from Trump and staying away from everything else. He knows what he's doing. He knows that he is making a path for himself. And we're seeing all of these articles and all of these people talking about the, the idea that, that Mike Pence thinks that he is destined to become a champion of God. He probably does. He probably thinks he's ordained. He probably thinks he's some sort of divine agent, like I talked about in the American Rule lectures. So here's the thing. How is it that Mike Pence could possibly gain from this? There is a possibility that Donald Trump doesn't make it out of this thing. There is a possibility. I don't know if that would be before the election. I don't know if that would be after. We have a, we have a question in here later about, um, you know, what about the long-term effects of COVID, what it means for Donald Trump. There is a lot of stuff in play right now. And, you know, people, people have been treating this like, and, and you'll notice it. It happened today in a big way. Donald Trump is sick, and this new poll came out that Biden was 14 points up. And what did people stop talking about? They stopped talking about the machinery that has been put in place for the past few months and past couple of years to the point where they have a machine set up to steal the election. Do you think for a second that these people who are part of this big conspiracy to steal the presidency of the United States of America... Do you think they're just standing down because Donald Trump got COVID? Hell no, they're not. They were using Donald Trump from the very beginning. He was a battering ram to get into the White House. He was the battering ram to start destroying the democratic institutions that stood in their way. These people are not going to stand down. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter if, if, if Donald Trump is incapacitated through Election Day. I mean, shit, there's probably, there have probably been conversations about the 25th Amendment. There's probably been talk about, you know, what it would look like to bring this or whatever. Pence is in a hell of a spot. If something bad happens to Trump, if, if Trump goes down, if Trump can't get out of the hospital, if he can't get over this thing, he's a martyr. All of a sudden, you have all of the good things for them from Donald Trump without the bad. There are no more gaffes. There are more, no more scandals, no more embarrassments. But you have the Donald Trump supporters who are in deep mourning for their warrior and they're willing to fight in his memory. You wave the bloody shirt. You, maybe you even talk about the possibility that he was poisoned or that the Democrats betrayed him and betrayed the country, which is something that they've talked about for years. They did this before Donald Trump was ever a politician. They did this in the 1990s. They did this in the 1980s. They did it in the late 1970s. This thing is not stopping simply because Donald Trump is in the hospital and sick. In fact, it gives them an opening and an opportunity to possibly figure out a way to have power. If Donald Trump doesn't make his way through this, you better believe that Mike Pence is going to attack this in such a way that the evangelical white population is going to believe that they just lost their Constantine or their Paul or any of these other divine agents they thought they've had and he has led the way to their white horse to go ahead and figure out what to do. This thing isn't just going to stop. These people are so close 
to their final moment. This is what they've been working on for generations now. This is not a project that popped up in 2016 when Donald Trump threw his hat in the ring. It just so happened that Donald Trump saw them, used them, they formed a partnership, and they started doing things. This is why Bill Barr is doing what he's doing. This is why McConnell has been doing what he's doing with the judiciary. This has been a long project. They're not just going to let it slip through their fingers when it's right there. They have the Supreme Court. They have the judiciary. They've already destroyed so much of the democratic institutions. And now here we are. And by the way, we're on the precipice of a major, major climate catastrophe. We're, we're on the precipice of a new economy. We're on the precipice of a new ideology taking us into a new age. These are not people who are just like, well, we'll try again in four years. Good luck, Joe Biden. Take care of yourself. They have the machinery in place. And in fact, they have the scapegoat. Like, at this point, they can just say, well, this is what Donald Trump was doing. We're just following his orders and, and, and going in the direction that he was taking us. I'm just telling you, nobody's talking about this thing. And just like always, Mike Pence is in the back of the room avoiding all of the shit and gaining all the power that he possibly can from the situation. This thing is not just going to end because Donald Trump is sick. And, and just because Joe Biden is up 14 points doesn't mean we're going to have a free and fair election. It doesn't mean that suddenly we're going to have like a blowout victory over Joe Biden and everything will be fine. That's not how this is going to work. These people do not give up power willingly. And especially now that they have Donald Trump in a position where they could gain from him. That's it. Oh, voting in Georgia is an absolute mess. I don't know if you've heard about this, but... We have a governor who didn't really win an election. Kind of stole it. Cheers to that. Uh, Amber says, predictions for Tuesday's VP debate. Think about what I just said. Mike Pence right now has an opportunity going into the election, or going into the debate, first of all. Which, by the way, my birthday. I'm looking forward to it. And by that, I mean I'm not really looking forward to it. But, uh, yeah, my birthday's on Wednesday. And to celebrate, by the way, just to go ahead and throw a plug out there. Um, Muckrig Podcast is doing a uh, live watch and analysis and reaction. We did it for the uh, presidential debate. I thought it was a good time. It was nice hanging out with the Muckrig community. Um, so if you want to watch that with us, it would be wonderful. Uh, that's over at patreon.com slash podcast. Go become a patron, uh, support my stuff, support uh, the podcast. Uh, we'll be watching that. No, Mike Pence is coming out as the president and waiting. This is his opportunity to show himself as the leader taking over from where Donald Trump has left off. You have a president who's in the hospital, he's debilitated, and this is Pence's opportunity to come out as the de facto president of the United States of America. He's going to come out firing. Now, that being said, uh, Kamala Harris is a hell of a debater. And a prosecutor. And I think she understands, and I'm sure the Biden campaigns understands it as well, that this is an opportunity to really, um, really land a blow and really put him in his place. Uh, I, I watched part of that debate, and I have to tell you that I think Lindsey Graham is in real trouble. I, I would not put money on him losing that spot right now, but um, I think he's in trouble. I think it's going to be a lot. I think it's going to be a lot. Uh, oh yeah, so again, real fast on the Pence thing. Like, he truly honestly believes that God has put him in a position for power. Like, that's who these people are. They truly believe that they are, um, that they are ordained by God. And, and when you start dealing with that sort of, uh, of lunacy, the idea that you are a divine agent, you are a prophet, and you are, no, it's the one before the big 4 -0. Thank you. Had to bring that up. Uh, but it's, uh, when you believe that you could possibly be a divine agent or a prophet and the leader of the country and think that you're carrying out, some, you know, God's ordained vision and possibly lead the United States into a theocratic, um, I don't know, New Jerusalem uh, situation, that's madness. But that's truly, I mean, and, and by the way, you watch at that debate, if it happens, by the way, you watch at that debate and you watch how Pence comes out and he's going to come out trying to be the de facto president. They're already spinning the story that he was at the super spreader event and he didn't get it. He was right in the middle of everybody. Why didn't he get it? Because God didn't want him to. 
He's ordained. God picked him. He's right there. And man, look at this entire situation. Isn't it sad that we lost da 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 and we lost da da da? But Mike Pence, I'm just telling you. Jackie says, TV doctor is very upset that Trump is in charge of his care, saying he should have been allowed to, shouldn't have been allowed to go on the drive. They say his medication as well as COVID can affect his behavior. Who can stop him? The 25th Amendment or impeachment don't seem emergency friendly. I don't know. If you have an ordained vice president ready to take over the presidency, the 25th Amendment sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I There's stuff going on that nobody wants to talk about and nobody wants to look at. That's a thing. That's a thing. And you have a president of the United States who's pretty sick. I... These are these are these these are things that we got to talk about. These are things that we got to look at. We got to really deal with and wrap our heads around. Jessica says, "So someone just said we have entered North Korea terrain. Is that true? Absolutely. No, that's exactly what this is all about. It's exactly what it's all about. Real fast. Virginia says Pence is not likable. I completely agree. But do you know what he is? He's gonna like if he were to take over after Trump. Oh my God, our media would lick his boots like that." Oh, he would say all the right things. He would, oh my God, he would look at the flag and get misty. He'd talk about God. He would talk, I, I, I mean, like, they, they, he would He would, He would. would have all of the white nationalistic evangelical stuff, but the media would just line up for him. And compared to Trump, for them, he would be everything that they wanted. Oh my God, Pence would just be everything that the media wants at this point. Um... Yeah, so th it's a North Korean type thing. That's what happens in these authoritarian states because it's all about this mythology and it's so fragile. Like if they even came out and were halfway honest about what his status was, if they if they even came out and like gave us a realistic briefing, like the whole thing would start to fall apart. It's it's a house of cards. And 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 that's the problem here is that none of this could possibly ever be told truthfully. Because all of it relies on the mythology. Everything has to be twisted. Nothing can be real. Everything has to be just a little, little, little off because it has to maintain the lie. Now, on that note, Janelle says, do you think we'll ever be told the truth about Trump's COVID-19 situation? I think that probably eventually the thing that we have found, and this is really disgusting, and, and you know, this is something that's bothered me, and I'm sure it's bothered you, there will be a book about it at some point. And it'll turn out that somebody has the truth about what's going on right now, and nobody wants to talk about it because they got to figure out a way. You know, there's probably right now, to tell you the truth, there's probably a book agent and a literary editor in a publishing house having a conversation about an investigative book about Trump's COVID situation and probably information about COVID treatment around the country. And, um, and that would be it, you know, and they would get their money. That's the way they would figure the thing out. They would they would get their money. And then later on, we'll get this book, I don't know, probably in a year, year and a half, however long it takes. And then we'll find out how this whole thing actually played out. That's, that's when we'll find the truth out about this thing. And it won't matter at that point. It won't matter at that point. Oh, Wall Street would love Pence as president. Absolutely they would. Oh my God, that would be a match made in heaven. He can go out and he can talk about God and American exceptionalism. And meanwhile, he'll uh, he'll sell the country out to Wall Street and that'll be the end of it. All they want is somebody who's not going to challenge the status quo. They actually don't even care if it's a Democrat or Republican. Like they just want somebody who's not going to rock the boat. That's the only thing Wall Street cares about. And on top of that, we've talked about in past live streams, mostly they make money off an America that doesn't work. So, like, you know, they're they're happy as long as this thing doesn't actually, you know, use any money to make people's lives better. And it's just about consumption and throwing money back into the market. Paula says, if he falls into a coma or even dies, will they even tell us? I think, number one, um, I think if he went into a coma, I, I, I don't think that we would know. That's the problem. I think if he dies, we'd find out. I mean, I, I, I think that would be almost instantaneous. I don't think it'll be like a, you know, weekend at Bernie's type situation or anything. But yeah, I mean, if you told me right now that Trump had lost consciousness once or twice, I wouldn't be totally shocked. I mean, 
his oxygen situation has been bad. He's not in good shape. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked about that at all. But yeah, I think if he dies, I, I, I think we would know. The question is, like, would they think about hiding it? I think there are de definitely people who would think about it. I really think that. Okay. Wobblies United. What do you think happens if Trump makes a full recovery? I can see them spinning this to make him look superhuman and thus further the chosen one narrative. Yeah, that's a real possibility. That is a real possibility. I mean, they, listen, there's a lot of stuff here. I mean, they, one of the things that people like to do particularly is they always like to project like Christian mythology. I, I'm sure that there's like a part of them that, uh, and how long has he been in the hospital for? Is today day two? Is that right? Am I wrong on that in, in today, day two? Because he went in on Friday. So he was in there on Friday, Saturday. I mean, I, 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 I could see someone who keeps an eye on this evangelical bullshit who tries to get him in there for three days and then he comes up on the on the third. I wouldn't be shocked by that. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that like these people just eat up. Uh, this idea of the Christ mythology or whatever. But... Um, yeah, I think if he gets out, I, I think I think they'll do the whole he's ordained and, and God saved him and spared him and look how strong he is. I mean, they're already doing that. They are such bootlickers, man. They are talking left and right about how strong he is and how he's probably the strongest president ever. I don't know if you saw the tweet. It was one of my favorite tweets in a very long time. And it was like the list of mortality rates for the ages. And they were like, well, Trump should probably be in the 20-year-old range because of how strong he is. And it's like, have you looked at this guy? Trump looks like a like a stiff breeze would send him flying and toppling. Oh, it's so pathetic. Oh, my. God. Anyway, if he makes it through this thing, yeah, I, I, I think they'll spin it as he's stronger and, and more powerful than the disease. And I don't think he's going to learn anything from this. I mean, absolutely not. He doesn't learn from anything. No way. Mike says, what's the probable impact of Trump's hospitalization on the election? I don't know. I really don't. I think Trump, um, I, I, I think Trump's definitely going to lose the election if it's free and fair. Uh, this thing, what's happening right now, I think it hurts his chances to be reelected. I mean, it's really hard to go to the polls and, and vote for somebody who not only was terribly wrong about the pandemic, but now you have questions about his health going forward. You have questions about whether or not he's even told the truth about his health. Um, I think it hurts his chances. I think this is going to be one of the weirder elections that we'll ever have, obviously. But, um, yeah, I, I, but again, I was saying it earlier. I don't think that this changes all the plans to steal the election. I just don't think it does. And I think that, I think the idea of the election being stolen or subverted or pushed to the Supreme Court as a strategy and um, this whole, um, you know, throwing doubt into the democratic process and overriding it, um, I, I think that's so frightening. And it's so upsetting and it's just it's it, it, it's so traumatic sounding that we're hoping like hell it just doesn't happen. And I think that's one of the reasons why Trump getting sick has set off this big, long line of people being like, nah, this it'll be better. Everything's going to be fine now. And he'll just sort of go away and we'll all be fine. I, I, I think we're still facing the real possibility that this election could be subverted and stolen. Josiah, it's November 3rd and Donald Trump still hasn't gotten out of the hospital. What does that mean for the election? You know, I think he still gets probably the same number of votes. I, I, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, I don't think that anybody who supports Donald Trump actually cares about reality. They care about the idea of Trump. They care about Trump flags. They care about MAGA hats. They care about pissing off their neighbors with their yard signs. I don't think they give one shit about, you know, what his actual health is or what he's going to do or where he's at. So I think he probably still gets most of the votes that he would have got. Um, I think there's probably a couple of Republicans here and there who would probably peel off, but God knows who they are I, I, and where they are. That's the big question is what state are they in and are they in a place where they could possibly even actually affect, you know, the election. But um, yeah, I think even if he's still in the hospital, I, I, I think people still vote for him. Sid Vicious, Trump polls numbers continue to sink. Do you see any way he can still get the votes he needs to win? Absolutely. The Electoral College makes it where... Any person with a following among white supremacists and, and 
frightened white people can win an election. That's why the Electoral College was put in place. Hell, that's one of the reasons why the Senate was put in place the way that it was. It's created a situation where people like Trump have a natural advantage. All you got to do is you got to go out and you got to talk about white supremacy and paranoia. And there you go. And, and you can win an election. It doesn't matter if it's only like, you know, what, 35, 40 percent of the country. So, yeah, Donald Trump absolutely still has a chance to win the election because of the Electoral College. Abolish that shit. It's a white supremacist relic. It's a dinosaur fossil of white supremacy. It's terrible. Rich H., should we be concerned about the cognitive effects of COVID and or med medications in the presidency? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, absolutely we should. Meanwhile, meanwhile, like, you know, like I was saying, it's like the media is talking about Trump and they're just like, oh, you know, we're, we're all just hoping for the best. Well, that's fine. Hope for the best, but have some actual conversations about national security. There are conversations all around the world right now among people and, and people that we might even consider our friends. I don't know, like a Saudi Arabia or something like that, where they're talking about using this against us and taking advantage of, of Trump's condition. Like we're more in danger tonight because Trump is sick and exposed himself to the coronavirus and didn't take the precautions he needed to take and didn't take it seriously in the first place. We are more endangered right now because of that. Uh, we should be talking about that. We should be talking about long-term effects. We should be talking about the stability of government. Like these are conversations we actually should be having, should be having if we were a rational nation. But we're not a rational nation because we're still talking about flags and symbols and soaring eagles and all this bullshit and showing Marine One flying into the skyline and and this is where the president stays when he's at Walter Reed and oh my God. Like, we're not talking about reality. That's the biggest problem right now, is we are talking about an alternate reality where symbols matter more than real things. Will Bear says we're all going to be done, prevent states like uh, Pennsylvania from appointing Trump electors regardless of the vote? That's a great question. I think that we personally should be having, you know, conversations about grassroots action. I hope like hell in the swing states that there are grassroots organizations that are talking about mass action going into the streets, changing the narrative. And by the way, that's something we got to talk about. One of the things with mass action that we have to do when we're talking about this, when we're talking about what a protest is, on one hand, it is about showing our disdain and that we don't agree with these things and that they're wrong. It's also about changing narrative. You also have to figure out a way to short circuit and short wire this media bullshit and make sure that they start talking about real things and that they take things seriously. Because I'm telling you, even if the election is stolen, they're going to forget about it so quickly and they're going to treat it as a both sides issue and they're going to treat it like it's totally, totally fine. Like mass action has to be about not only stopping it, but it also has to be about making sure that the narrative doesn't move forward and the people forget what happened. Oh. Man, I'm glad we do this. I just gotta tell you, I'm glad that we do this. This was a, a hell of a week. Um, yeah, I was I was excited to get out here and do this tonight because this is. Uh, whew, they don't make weeks like this very often. They really don't. Jack Burton says, "Can you foresee any circumstance related to this COVID thing where POTUS voluntarily hands over power?" No. Uh, however temporary, or would the cabinet have to take it from him? Any thoughts on the implications? No, he would never give up power. Not a chance. Not even a little bit. No. I mean, that's the only thing that really matters to him. That and the adulation and worship of crowds that he couldn't give two shits about anyway. Um, I mean, could the administration take it from him? Could the cabinet take it from him? Absolutely. I, I, I think that they've been thinking about that since the beginning of this thing. I think that probably the people in Trump's orbit have had regular conversations about taking power from him using the 25th Amendment. I think that's just been a, a pretty regular conversation among all these people. Cops are a cult. Can you think of a more high-profile example of such simultaneous irony and karma? No. I can't. Uh, there's something poetic about... Donald Trump not only mishandling the coronavirus pandemic, but doing so in such a reckless way for political purposes while understanding its danger, thinking that everybody else was at risk except for himself, and eventually it got back to him. I, I mean, like it's so ridiculous that the reason he has COVID is because 
he knew it was a problem, but him and the Republicans just couldn't even be bothered to pretend like it was a real issue. Because if they did that, then suddenly their entire political appeal would start falling. Plus, they needed to appeal to, you know, people who were afraid of being emasculated or their, you know, their masculinity made them overcompensate and pretend like this thing wasn't real. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's poetic irony. It absolutely is. Todd, the thing we say happens. Does Trumpism go away? Could democracy be saved? No, Trumpism doesn't go away. Um, you know, he becomes a martyr. That's what ends up happening. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but even if Donald Trump loses this election, even if he tries to steal the election and is stopped, there's still going to be millions of Americans who not only support him, but hold him up as an icon. Um, I, I, I was telling somebody this the other day. I might have been on the, the Buck Rake podcast. Uh, there are people who like still walk around saying that Richard Nixon was a hero and uh, that he, um, you know, that he didn't get caught doing anything other presidents didn't do. And he was great. And he opened up China and all this stuff. There are going to be people who are going to be Trumpists the rest of their, of their lives. That's just uh, the long and the short of it. And, uh, you know, again, sadly, I, I think this could be a situation where something does happen to Trump. You're going to see a lot of people who are going to use Trump's memory to their own advantage. I've been saying this since the beginning. Um, there are people who are a lot more disciplined, who have a lot more ideology and a lot more plans than Donald Trump, who have looked at Donald Trump, are reverse engineering how he came to power and how he's won these battles against democratic institutions. And they're trying to figure out how to use that to their advantage. I mean, again, Mike Pence, Tom Cotton, all these assholes, they are absolutely trying to figure out how to carry the mantle of Trumpism after Trump. Absolutely they are. Jim McCarr, Trump's latest video from Walter Reed. He talks about going to the real school of COVID and what he's learned is very interesting. Do you think he's about to downplay COVID and the entire pandemic is not so bad? If he survives, probably. He's probably going to come out and talk about herd mentality. That would be my guess if, if he comes out and does anything about it. So I would assume that he'll come out and be like, they can treat this thing. They're doing this. They're doing that. I, I, I would have to assume that it would probably be one of those situations. He's not going to learn anything from this. I mean, my God. Herd mentality. It really, I really think that's probably where it would be. On his rocker. Why do you think Dems have to be the model of decorum? Well, the GOP can do literally whatever the hell it wants. When Biden took down his attack ads, I was deeply ambivalent, admiring his class, but wishing he'd play hardball. I will say this. The attack ads aren't attack ads. They're just verbatim, like, iterations of, of Trump's record. Yeah, they're quote-unquote, you know, negative ads, but they're negative because Donald Trump is an embarrassment, a shameful president. I The Democrats, and I wrote about this not too long ago, the Democrats have approached this entire situation for decades, and every time that the Republican Party plays what you would call hardball or engages in um, bad faith politics. I don't know what's going on over there. There's a lot going on over there. Are you hearing all this? Hmm. something going on over there. It's weird. It's weird being out here... Um, it's weird out here doing these bourbon talks and like sort of like like knowing like that people have just sort of like shown up around my house like in the middle of the night and like you know made threats and stuff it's weird sometimes like you know being out here and and, and just sort of being like focused over here having lights over here and not knowing what's going on it's a weird time it's a really weird ass time anyway uh the dims they every time that the Republican Party is engaged in this bad, bad faith politics, um, they've continued to behave in good faith and sort of looked to the media and other politicians and sort of expected them to play referee because they wanted to, they didn't they never wanted to be seen as the group that was playing in bad faith politics. Which, by the way, I would love if we weren't dealing in an escalative uh, 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 trench warfare political type situation. But this type of thing, like, I'm sorry, but Donald Trump exposed himself to coronavirus. It was his own fault, his own failure. It was, a, it, it, it was his own mess that he created and he perpetrated. 
why in the world would you take away ads where you talked about how he's failed? Because he has failed. Just because the president of the United States is sick doesn't mean that the president suddenly turns into a saint. Like he's a failure and he's a danger. And even if he is sick, and by the way, like I'm one of those people, I'm like, I hope he makes a full recovery. I hope he lives to lose the election uh, for the sake of, of his kids, whatever relationship he has with them. And for Barron especially, he hasn't done anything. For their sake, I hope he lives. I hope he lives long enough to lose the election. I hope he's held responsible for what he's done. I'm not going to hold my breath over that because I don't think that presidents prosecute other presidents because they don't want to be prosecuted themselves. I would like to see him held accountable. Um, but yeah, I I, I, I I don't understand pulling the negative ads just because he got sick on his based on his own fault and based on his own carelessness and you know basically because he committed genocide against the American people during a pandemic. I don't I don't see why you would take the ads down. But the Democratic Party has been playing a different game for years and years and years. And it hasn't worked, and it's made things worse. I'll just be honest. Jessica, I've been reading American Rule. Thank you. And loving it, but I have to ask. Is it off-putting to have predicted all of this and seen it coming? It feels like it would be off-putting. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, would, rather, um, I would rather have been wrong about all of this. I would rather have been wrong about Trump. Uh, I think about this a lot. You know, I, when I was covering Trump in 2016 and going to these rallies and talking to his supporters, um, you know, I saw something really bad coming down the tracks. Um, I really wanted to be wrong. You know, I was warning people before the election that uh, he was crooked and, you know, the danger that it would mean if he became president. Uh, I knew that he had the support of a growing fascistic movement. I knew the danger that was there. I didn't fully understand the danger until I started researching it in 2017 and 2018. And I started like really getting a grasp of the history. And then of course, writing American rule, like this stuff really became very obvious and, and, and not just obvious, but like sadly obvious, like this stuff isn't, uh, when you actually start digging into fascism in American history, these things are not, um, they're not hidden. They're there. They're there to be seen. They're there to be absorbed. They're there to be learned from. I want to be wrong. And, you know, I've actually had a lot of people who are like, well, you have to be happy right now, or you must be pleased that this thing has turned out like this. I'm not at all. I wish like hell that I, I wish like hell it wasn't like this. Like, I wish I was wrong. I wish I wish Donald Trump would have been a, a, a great president who behaved legally and led the country and had great successes. I mean, I, I'm in a situation the people I know and love are in situations where, like, we're suffering because of this, too. I know people, you know, of, of <laughs> I know people of color. I, I, I know LGBTQ Americans who are terrified. And, and, and I don't want that for them. I want this to be better. I would. God, I don't want to be. I don't want to be the person who gets on Twitter and talks about fascism and threats and alternate weaponized realities. I, I'm sure as shit don't want to be that. Like, I would much rather still just be writing fiction and, and maybe having an occasional political debate. This is not how I pictured life going. It's, it's, I didn't, I, I thought, I, I, I thought he would get defeated in 2016. I could just hang this stuff up. Um, I, I just, I, I don't want this. So yeah, it's really off-putting. This is upsetting. I, I, I don't, I don't want to live in a country like this. I don't, I don't want things to go like this. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be right. I don't want to be right. And the people I talk to who have been on this case, they don't want to be right either. And, um, it's terrible. I, it just is terrible. I, yeah, I don't want to be right. And I'm really, really tired. And uh, it's incredibly off-putting. And knowing this stuff and now looking back through history, like I said, I'm writing this new book and I'm like going back to like ancient Rome right now, like seeing the way these cycles have replayed themselves and the way these things have worked, like it's demoralizing and tiring and frustrating. Yeah, it really, really is. But I, I wish, I wish like hell that it wasn't like this.
and I wish that it was wrong. I really do. Going up on 20 seconds until we're at one hour. I hope you'll hang out for a minute. We've got uh, we've got just a handful of uh, questions left, and then uh, we'll get out of here. But I'm going to hang out for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Cheers to an hour. Oh, I'm glad we do this. I, 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 I wasn't really planning on doing this Sunday night thing. Like, I, I, I don't know. I just got a, a wild hair one day. I'm so glad that we started doing this. Erica, because I cannot deal with the current frenzy, I'm immersed in learning about the role of the Council for National Policy in our government. Have you begun to research? Uh, and uh, seems to have served as a 21st century exemplar for the foundation of American rule. Love the book. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, the truth is that there are just so many of these right-wing organizations. I mean, w one of the things that I think that, um, I think this is one of those things that we really need to wrap our heads around, and this is something that we really, really need to put into perspective. The right is so much more organized and disciplined. Like their stuff, they have been fighting this game on a level that nobody else was fighting it for a very long time. Setting up these connections, these organizations, taking over the judiciary. Um, I wrote about today um, in the in the thread that I posted, like the the think tank anti intelligentsia. Like I mean, they 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 had a plan starting in the nineteen seventies. And they were just like, we are going to see this plan through because facts and science and reality didn't work for them. They weren't going to win elections as long as people understood what was going on, as long as people were up to date about facts and figures. And, you know, they couldn't win elections in reality. They had to create their own reality and they had to create their own power structure. And so they created an impenetrable ecosystem that these people live in. It turned into a fascist cult. But, you know, there you are. Uh, and then, you know, they created these systems of power that maintain power. They train people to become politicians and pundits and pseudo experts and, you know, sort of the avatars of wealth and power for the right. Um, we got to work on it. We got to work on it. And we have to understand about where this came from, how it was put together and how it works. And once we finally understand that, we can start to dismantle it and replace it with something better realer and more human okay we got a couple more wear a gd mask cheers you said you believe we're all under surveillance i'm a longtime progressive activist campaign worker attender of marches do you think i should start scrubbing social media deleting my facebook how careful should i be i keep facebook for two reasons i keep facebook first and foremost because it's one way that i can talk to certain people and i keep it to keep um, surveillance on certain groups uh, so I can understand how that social media platform is being used to radicalize people and uh, lead them astray. That being said, I it's probably time to get off Facebook if you're not doing it for research purposes or if there's not people that you know you can't keep in contact with otherwise. I mean, it is, it's a really dangerous place. And those people don't give a shit about us or democracy. I talk about this all the time. They're post-political. They don't care one way or another about the right or the left. They don't care whether you're free or you're imprisoned and imp oppressed. I mean, Zuckerberg went over to China, took a shit ton of money and just created like one of the most sophisticated censor and surveillance tools known to man. If you think for a second that they won't do that for somebody here in America, you are dead wrong. Uh, and I keep saying this, Richard Nixon, when he was in charge of the government, used every bit of power in the government in order to surveil and depress people. He used the CIA, he used the FBI, he used private intelligence, he used all of these different apparatuses. If you think that Donald Trump and the people around him haven't been using those apparatuses as well, and possibly even more so, got another thing coming. So what I would do is if you're worried about that stuff, like if you're asking that question, I would go ahead and scrub it. I mean, I, I, I think Twitter is really important in terms of learning information and actually keeping up with truth and reality. It, weirdly enough, I think a lot of us have short circuited the machine in order to actually understand what's going on. 
as a big giant limb just fell. It's an active evening in southeastern Georgia. Holy shit. <laughs> but, you know, Twitter... I, I, I described it the other day. I can't remember if I talked about it on here or on a podcast. Twitter's a lot like screaming into a jar. Um, you know, like it is a capitalistic tool that uses our outrage and our fear and anxiety and, and keeps us going back and tweeting about it. And, you know, it makes us tweet as if we're corporations that are taking care of our branding and, and releasing press releases. Um, like, you can use it for good. I think I think Twitter is, is less dangerous than Facebook in that way. You can use it for good, but you need to be wary about it. Uh, if you are concerned, if you are an activist, I would use like a, you know, a VPN or Signal or something along those lines. You know, I'd figure something out. Blake Berlin, what is your current opinion about the resolve of the American people? We're here, aren't we? We're showing up. We're still fighting. We're still resisting this thing. I'm incredibly proud of people. I really am. I said it earlier. We're being abused constantly. We're being subjected to constant trauma and abuse, intentional weaponized abuse. We're exhausted. We're tired. We're demoralized. We're frightened. But holy shit, we're still here. I... I've been really inspired over the past few years. Um, it started in 2017. It was after I wrote um, People Are Going to Rise. And I went on tour for that. And I was meeting people out and about. Which, by the way, forgive me this uh, digression. I am so upset that American Rule came out during the pandemic. And I'm not like out on the road meeting you fine people. <laughs> And like shaking your hands and getting to know you, getting to know the people who listen to the muckrake and, and, and just out like going to bookstores. That was like my favorite thing in the world, meeting people at these events, shaking hands afterwards, you know, hugging people, posing for photographs. It breaks my heart. Oh my God. It's exhausting and it wears you out. But holy shit, do I wish that I, I could be out on the road right now meeting people and, and, and getting to know people. It sucks. Oh, it was so weird. I, you know, I, I, I got this like good book contract and I got this like, you know, big book that came out, American Rule. And like, I was just like, man, I can't wait to get out there on the road and have like a big giant book tour. And I'm so pumped. <sighs> anyway, so when I was out there for um, the people are going to rise, I kept meeting people who, um, I'm so sad I'm not at the Decatur Book Festival too. What a good book festival. So I kept meeting people. And after Trump got elected, everybody just started talking about politics in a much more in, in, in informed manner. Like they suddenly understood how government worked. They, they started to understand how Donald Trump had come into power. They started talking about volunteering. They started talking about working within the system. They started talking about running for office. They started talking about grassroots activism. It was really inspiring. I was terrified that Trump would get in and that the mythologies that I've written about and talked about, I, I was afraid that he would get in, the media would just automatically just trumpet him and launder all of his bullshit and that maybe we would just sort of slide into oblivion without a fight. That's not what it is like we are fighting and we are here and we care and what's more i'm going to talk a little bit about this more in a second we're like forming communities like like what are we doing here it's a sunday evening it's 10 after 9 on the east coast i'm sitting here talking into a camera i've got an arc light on my face i'm drinking bourbon and talking to you fine people and like I'm getting to know people and we're forming networks and we're forming communities. Um, by the way, it just, just popped in my head. Um, the Patreon, Buckrake podcast, Patreon is about to open up a discord. We're going to have, we're, we're going to get to know each other better. We're going to be able to, to deal with things together. I, I, we've had, um, we've had chats. We had a, we had a muckrake chat not too long ago where people were talking about like intentional communities and setting up support networks for each other. 
that's cool as hell. Like that's the type of stuff that is going to fix things. Right. Like that sort of community, that sort of taking care of each other, the repairing of the atomization of societal bonds and communal bonds. Like that's how we're going to figure it out. That's how we're going to make this thing work. Mutual aid, realizing that we don't need to wait on the government to, you know, suddenly get off their ass and help us. We have to remember that we have power and that we have communities and that if we want the government to work, we have to make it work. So. I, I'm pretty inspired by the American people's resolve. We're lost as hell in a bunch of lies and a bunch of mythology. I mean, it is a big, it's like when, um, it's like when you take out your earbuds from like a drawer and they're like a big knot and they're in another knot with a bunch of other things. Like we have so many knots and it feels like every time you pull it a thread, another one gets tired. And I get, so, I have to be honest with you. I get so frustrated sometimes and it's like on Twitter or, you know, I'll write an article or something and, you know, I'll, I'll talk about like real history or I'll talk about like, you know, disarming these mythologies. Like I get so frustrated sometimes by like people who don't want to do it. Like I had, I had somebody not too long ago, they wrote me about American rule and they were like, how dare you talk about Abraham Lincoln being a white supremacist? I was like, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's it's the truth. Why do you want to protect a mythology that's not real? Like, why do you want to be lost in these lies? And I understand that there's comfort in it for some people not wanting to actually have to look at this stuff on its face and actually have to start, like, thinking about themselves and introspection and societal and personal privilege. I understand that. I get so frustrated. But I have to tell you, man, people are cool as hell. They really, really are. And they love each other and they take care of each other. And watching the way people are responding to this pandemic and this societal crisis, I am, I'm, I feel very good about our resolve. That doesn't mean that our leadership is going to come through. That doesn't mean that we're going to avoid something really bad. We have a chance. We have a chance to do that. We have a real opportunity to make something good out of this. We really do. Stardust says, how do people stay sane during all of this? Well, first and foremost, I have to say that you you have to you have to engage in self-care. You have to you have to realize that you're being abused and traumatized and gaslit. And you have to surround yourself with people who will remind you that you're not insane and that you're not irrational and that um, you know, that your your compass is true. Um, that's really, really important. I, I think I think nearly everybody should be in therapy. I think that's good for people. I think it's good to sit and wonder about who you are and why you do the things you do and, you know, what, what all that does. I think we have to find things that get us away from the TV sets and the Twitter every now and then. Um, you know, somebody said, work out in the yard, work out in the yard, go for runs, go for walks, paint a house. I don't know, do something, but occasionally give yourself some time. And do some stuff that allows you your own space. Donald Trump doesn't own every second of your life. Donald Trump doesn't own your reality. Like you can tune him out and still keep an eye on him and still get educated and still get pissed off and still get organized. But you got to find the stuff for you and you have to find the things that fill you up and the stuff that makes you feel like there are reasons to live that can be family that can be friends that can be relationships that can be a hobby that can be a pursuit um you know it, it's it's finding time for yourself it's finding time for rest and respite and and here's the other thing we just got to keep getting educated we got to keep learning we got to keep reading we got to keep studying and researching and all this stuff because it's not just about us we're going to have a larger responsibility for future generations I mean, it's bad now, but I mean, after the climate catastrophe hits, I mean, it's it's going to be really bad if we don't fight this thing back. We got to add to generational conversations. We have to build communities. We have to make this thing better. I know cynicism is very, very easy, and I get cynical myself sometimes. But we got to try. We got to try because I, the alternative is too bad. It's just too bad. Monday, what do we do, Jared? 
I know to get educated, get angry, get organized, but my morale is waning. I'm exhausted. I don't feel like myself anymore. I'm with you. I'm with you. I didn't think my life was going to look like this. Turn, turn 39 on Wednesday. And again, presidential debate. Come out, hang out. Maybe I'll have a piece of cake. We'll see. I like cake. Cake's good. I'm a frosting guy. I don't know how everybody feels about it. I'm a frosting guy. I like store-bought cake. I like frosting. Good stuff. White cake, white icing. Ooh, good stuff. Turn 39 on Wednesday. Feels weird having a birthday. Um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic is weird. Can't hang out with your friends. Can't go out. Can't have a nice meal somewhere. You know, um, it's odd. It's hard sometimes. I feel feel depressed at times. I think we all do. And I don't know how you couldn't at times in the midst of all of this. Again, you're being attacked constantly by people who want to win a war against you. I mean, one of, one of the things that takes place in a war, particularly something like a trench warfare or something, uh, they found that propaganda, what they would do is they'd fly over and they would drop pamphlets and they'd be like, you know, aren't you tired? Aren't you exhausted? Don't your feet hurt? Don't you miss your family? All that stuff. And they did it to try and mess with the morale. They did it to mess with how you felt. This right now is a war of attrition, but it doesn't mean that we have to starve ourselves. It doesn't mean that we have to abuse ourselves. It doesn't mean we have to further traumatize ourselves. The good news is this. If you're exhausted, if you need a break, we need to believe in solidarity and community. Let some other people do the heavy lifting for a minute because we'll do it. We'll do it. We need to feel like there's hope through community and solidarity. We have to believe that everybody can fight, everybody can help each other, and when we fall, we'll pick each other up. We have to start having trust. I, I, I think about this a lot. Um, I'll tell you... One of the things that um, I have a hard time, and back in the day, back when I used to go on road trips, going on road trips is like my favorite thing in the world. Um, I've always had a problem sleeping while somebody else drives. But I talk about this uh, in my classes all the time. It's like you you have trouble sleeping while someone else drives, but if you can trust that the person driving is a decent driver and isn't going to take risks or whatever. Like it's a lot easier to go to sleep. We need to believe in one another and trust in one another. And that maybe if we take a day off and maybe if we go for a walk, maybe we don't turn the news on, maybe we don't log into Twitter, maybe we don't read a book, maybe we don't study for the big democracy test or whatever. And by the way, I don't know if you've been able to tell, but this next month is going to be bad shit insane. Like this week alone, I, I feel like I got more gray in my beard this week than I've gotten in a long time. We have, to take, we have to take a walk every now and then. We have to take a breath every now and then. It's demoralizing, it's traumatic, and it's hard. But we can do this. We can do it if we take care of each other. We can do it if we have hope. We can do it if we have faith in the future. If we have some sort of a plan and a vision and a hope. I keep saying it and I want to say it again. Have an idea about what you want this world to be like after Donald Trump. Because there's going to be a world after Donald Trump, whether we win this election, lose this election. There's going to be a world beyond Donald Trump. Trump isn't the end all. He's not the be all. He's not the disease. He's a symptom. What do you want? What do you want this world to look like? Because it can look radically different. And it can be a lot better than the world we had before Donald Trump. I can tell you that damn much. What do you want? Figure out what you want and, and, and track it down the exact way you track down anything else. You work your ass off for it, but you find time to replenish yourself and recharge your batteries. It's demoralizing. I don't feel like the same person that I was at the beginning of this. But when we look back, I have to tell you, this is going to feel like we've been through a war because we've been through a war honest to God. We absolutely have. I'm changed. I'm, I have to tell you, if you would have known me, my God, if you would have known me five years ago, I was not this guy. 
this is not who I was. I've had to grow up. I've had to change. I I make a lot more noise when I get out of bed in the morning. I'll tell you that. I've I've got a lot of miles on the odometer, and it's not simply because I was driving around the country or you know covering the election or writing books. It was it was a lot. It was a lot. My stuff says, "What will I do if Trump wins?" I will cry and I will mourn and I'll be angry and then I'll get up and I'll fight some more. That's what I'll do because I'm not giving this country over to those pieces of shit. We're going to beat the fascist. We're going to win this thing. We're going to make it better tomorrow. We're going to figure out a better reality. We're going to make this thing better. I truly, honestly believe that. It's frightening, weird, unpredictable. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're going to be fascist absolutely are cheers it's beating fascist knocking this shit back winning making a better realer more human future all right a couple plugs we'll get out of here um my Creek podcast is going to come out on tuesday a reminder on wednesday my birthday i would love to hang out with all of you wonderful beautiful people uh, we'll be covering the vice presidential debate, if if there is one, uh, to get access to that. Um, I don't believe there's going to be another presidential debate for sure, um, unless I don't know. Maybe they'll maybe they'll do it uh, via video. Who the hell knows? Anyway, if you want to be a part of that, if you want to support my work, go over to Patreon.com/slash Muckrake Podcast. We're going to be opening up a Discord. So we'll have better communication. This community is going to get to know each other. We'll be there for each other. It's going to be awesome as hell. Uh, thank you to Claire for putting that thing together. We just got to put the finishing touches on that. Uh, on top of that, uh, the second installment of the American Rule Lecture Series is going to come out, I think, on Wednesday. We're going to talk about James Madison, the construction of the United States government, uh, the fact that we basically handed over the store to white supremacists and uh, created a system of white supremacist power and capitalistic oppression, which is uh, it's rough, but we got to learn it. If you haven't already, go over and check out the uh, first uh, edition of the American Rule Lectures. Uh, talked about the idea of Amer- American exceptionalism, nationalist myth, and how those things collapse into uh, fascism. I hope you enjoyed the first one. Uh, I enjoy doing it. I'm, I'm a professor. I love getting on a whiteboard with a marker and getting notes on there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it because I enjoyed making it. Um, yeah, so hopefully I'll be putting those out uh, weekly or roughly or whatever. If you haven't already, pick up a copy of American Rule, A Nation Conquer the World or Failed Its People. I'm so glad it's out in the world. Your comments and your compliments uh, and support have been um, really touching really, really have. I didn't know how that book was going to be received. Um, You've made it well worth doing. And I have to tell you, I I, I beat the hell out of myself writing that book. I worked, I worked around the clock. Um, Yeah, that's a story for another day. But getting that book together and learning what I learned in the time span that I had to learn it, it was, uh, it was grueling. So I appreciate the the support and the fine, uh, fine things you've said to me. It's been a lot to me. You take care of yourself. I have so appreciated this and so enjoyed this. I looked forward to it. I look forward to it every week. We'll do this again next Sunday. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in the next week. I just know it's going to be crazy as hell. So buckle in. Be safe, everyone. Be good. Thank you.